Let me start this video by telling you that there are good news and bad news. The bad news are that you have to watch yet another video before we can get started with the coding part. The good news are that this video will be of particular importance and super helpful once you start coding. We will look at things like integrated development environments, I will show you what testing frameworks exist, but specifically one thing we will do is setting up our own blockchain with Ganache, a testing blockchain you can use when you're developing your smart contracts. All right, let's get started. Now, in this video, I just wanna give you some basic tools and also some intuition on what actually happens when you're developing your smart contract. So that you know and you understand the process, um, for example, with compiling, with deploying your smart contracts and also testing. So this is just to give you an overview before we start with coding, that you know the workflow, the development workflow and the, the different steps which are part of it. Now, when you look at the development workflow, there are essentially two parts. Um, number one is just the preparation with, uh, of course, you have to establish a blockchain connection. You have to, uh, to create your accounts. You have to fund these accounts uh, either with actual ETH or with test ETH or as we have done uh, in our uh, first few videos. Uh, you, you need an IDE, so an integrated developer environment. That's, that's basically where you're writing your code. In many cases, where you're deploying it from. Uh, you have to set up various tools. So this is just the preparation. And then of course, in the actual development part, you're creating, you're developing, you're coding your smart contract. So that's the development of the contract. Then you're compiling it. I will show you what exactly that means. Essentially, you can think of it as a, basically a translation uh, from your high level uh, code you're writing to something that can be interpreted by the machine, by the Ethereum virtual machine, the so-called bytecode. And then you deploy it. And the deployment, as you know, is uh, the action of adding it to the blockchain. That's the process when you're adding it to a transaction. When the transaction gets confirmed, then we say that the contract is being deployed. And last but not least, that's extremely important, is of course testing. And this doesn't mean that you shouldn't test before you actually have deployed your contract. Of course, you're always testing. But here, contract deployment, that doesn't just refer to mainnet. That doesn't just refer to contracts which are in production. In many cases, as you will see, you're deploying your smart contracts to test nets, to your, to your own private network. And you do so in order to be able to test it, to test and to write various test cases and to well evaluate the security and the functionality of your smart contract. And that is a workflow. Now, of course, there are different people with different workflows. It's in, I'm in no way saying you have to work like that, but these are just some obvious steps that give you some understanding of how you could approach something like that, of how you could approach a project when you're creating a smart contract. And most of these are pretty standard. So uh, I just assume whatever kind of workflow you are using, all of these steps will be part of it. Now, Let's start with the connection, the blockchain connection. And with the question, what are you connecting to? So what exactly are you using to deploy your smart contract on? And I mean, the, um, of course, the, the obvious choice uh, when we talk about Ethereum would be Ethereum mainnet. So the actual Ethereum blockchain. And this has many advantages. For example, it's, it's, it's secure. Uh, you have public access, there is some value involved. So, I mean, in terms of testing, that's always good, but it also has some severe disadvantages and I would not recommend testing your smart contracts, at least not initially on Ethereum mainnet because it's relatively slow. It's subject to a relatively high transaction fee in many cases to a really high uh, transaction fee. There is real value at stake. So when you find a bug, when there's something going wrong, uh, you're at risk of losing uh, whatever value is stored on the smart contract because we are talking about actual EVE. So this is really something that is obviously uh, well suited for production. So when you're uh, certain that your contracts work as intended, but not necessarily for development. I mean, it doesn't make too much sense that when you start out your development process that you're immediately going to Ethereum mainnet. Now, we have used the public testnet before for our value transactions when I introduced MetaMask, when I've shown you how you can transfer some ETH. And public net, testnets, of course, they have a relatively 
low security. In many cases, they can also be relatively slow because you have to wait for the confirmation. In some cases, they are even slower than if they remain net. But they have also the advantage that it's public. So a public test net, as you would expect by the name, is publicly available, publicly accessible. And of course, they have the advantage, and you've already seen that, that uh, for these test nets, for these different test nets, there are so-called facets where you can get some free test net ether. And this is great to just play around. Um, there is no value at stake. And it's ideal, for example, when you're already, already uh, relatively uh, far into the development process and you're, you, you've tested it on your private chains and so on. And then you just want to run, a, let's say, a public alpha. You want to uh, open it up to the public, but in a way that there is no value at stake. And uh, that's basically what you use these public test nets for. Something we will do as an exercise in this in this class, in this video rather, uh, is setting up a private test net. Um, so your own blockchain that is running on your own machine. Obviously, that's something that's private then. Um, no one else has access to this blockchain. It's really just uh, your own personal blockchain that acts like Ethereum. Um, that allows you to test smart contracts, allows you to test certain transactions in a protected environment, so on your own machine. And of course, security here is extremely low. I mean, there is no security whatsoever because essentially the consensus protocol is just uh, your machine decides on the next block. So it's not something you would run in production. Um, it's the, the, the advantage is that the speed, so the confirmation speed is uh, near instantaneously. Uh, access is private, as I've mentioned, and then again, we have the advantage that there is no value at stake, uh, that it's completely free. Uh, when you're setting up these, um, your personal blockchain, you basically get some pre-funded accounts you can use, and this is great for early development, so when you're just testing it out. Also, in, a, in a, an IDE, uh, a browser-based uh, development environment will be used uh, throughout this class called Remix. There is a JavaScript virtual machine implemented that um, in most cases um, acts exactly like the EVM, so it's great for some initial tests and uh, you can also use that. But I, I personally, I'd recommend that you quickly set up your own blockchain and we will do that, as I said, as an, as an exercise later uh, in this slide deck, in this video. And then what you also could do and that's, um, I mean, it's something that requires um, your own node in many cases. You could also use the archive node feature from Infura, uh, but there you have, in many cases, you have to pay for that. So it's it's not, with the, with the free plan, you will not get that far. Uh, what you can do is just fork the mainnet. So essentially take a, a state of Ethereum mainnet, fork it to your private chain and then run some transactions against a specific state of Ethereum mainnet. And this is great if you want to test something, let's say in the DeFi space where some uh, protocols, some contracts are deployed on mainnet and you want to have the actual states of these contracts. So with all of the account balances in tokens, in ETH, all of the states of the contract as it has been on Ethereum mainnet, then you just fork it you have it locally and uh, then you run some tests against it with your own smart contract. And uh, of course, security is very low, but that being said, what's great about that is um, that you can test certain transactions. You can mm, run some security tests as if it were on mainnet, even though this specific instance of the chain obviously is not protected by the consensus protocol of Ethereum mainnet. Uh, it gives you great insights, and it's if you want to test something that runs on mainnet, uh, then this is a uh, this is a great choice. Um, speed near instantaneously, uh, private access um, to your specific instance. Obviously, the data you have on there, since it is forked from Ethereum mainnet, it's not private. Um, value no cost uh, free, uh, and this is great just if you want to uh, develop against something that is a little more real than just a test net or your own personal private chain. Now, how are you connecting? There are basically two options. We briefly talked about that in the last video already. You can have your own local node, so setting up your own Ethereum node. Um, that's the best option in terms of security. 
it's great because you can locally validate everything. Um, you have some hardware requirements and particularly when you're setting up an archive node, um, then it's extremely high. And you really need a relatively good computer to do that, just with a regular full node. Um, that's manageable also on some older devices. But in any case, it's it's a good idea to run your own personal full note and connect with MetaMask through your own full note. And uh, of course, this is something that's um, true for the public test nets, that's true for uh, mainnet. Uh, when you have your own blockchain running, like uh, something we set up with Ganache, uh, then by definition you have your own full node because it's running on your computer it's set up there and then you're connecting to it so there are no services um, no third-party services and these third-party services they are the second option and again we're just talking about mainnet we're talking about some public test nets um, the idea is that you're not running your own full node the idea is that you're connecting to these services and that you get the information from these services and uh, the most uh, common one most popular one is Infura, um, they, they provide the service and it's also uh, what we use in, in the context of MetaMask um, in the background. So that's the reason why you don't have to set up your own full node for these examples, for these exercises, because in the background your MetaMask plugin just connects uh, to these third party providers. They have the full nodes running and that's where you get the information from. It's a convenient option, but as I said, it's heavily centralized. You're trusting these service providers. And if you want to have archive access, then in many cases, it's super costly. Um, there are some options where, for example, a few blocks back, um, you, you, that's something you can do with a free subscription. But if you want to have full archive access uh, with um, no or um, limited restrictions or something you can actually work with then in many cases you have to pay for it so let's look into the first exercise and i already told you um ganache that's something we use to create our own blockchain on our local machine and it's super easy to do i mean um, it, it sounds it sounds complicated when you're saying you're setting up your own blockchain but ganache is just this very convenient tool that allows you to do that in a um, in, in an easy, in a very easy way also if you have no experience with it whatsoever. Um, what it does is it sets up your own blockchain on your uh, computer. It pre-funds uh, some accounts with a uh, test ether, so test ether for your local chain. Uh, and then later on you can connect your uh, MetaMask uh, to that local chain and uh, interact with it just like we have interacted, for example, with Robson Testnet. And the things you do in this exercise is number one, install uh, Ganache on your own computer, then open Ganache and change the host name to local 0000, all interfaces. Uh, you already have MetaMask installed, you should have it from the previous video. Um, then just like we have connected to Robston Testnet in one of the previous videos, uh, you connect to a private chain um, with the RPC URL, um, localhost 8545 and chain ID 1337. Um, by the way, the chain ID that there are different IDs for these different chains. Ethereum mainnet has one, for example. Um, then you have for all of the test nets, you have certain chain IDs. Also, Ethereum Classic, for example, uh, has its own chain ID. And uh, for the for the local one, so for the one you're running on your own computer, we use. 1337. Then you import the Ganache private key of account one, uh, account one in Ganache, so in the Ganache interface to MetaMask. Um, it's quite easy to find out how you can do that in your MetaMask plugin. Uh, MetaMask does not only allow you to create uh, new accounts that are based on your monomic phrase, so automatically create these accounts. You can also import additional private keys, so private keys that have been created externally, but you have to be aware that in that case, in this case, obviously, uh, the backup is not included in your monomic 
phrases because these external private keys, when, they, when you are adding them manually to your MetaMask, then they are not part, obviously, of the monomic phrases. They are not part of the, of the seed, uh, essentially, that is used to derive all of these private keys, all of these accounts. So that's something you have to be aware of. But since we're not playing around with any actual fonts, that's uh, not too big of a deal. It's just something you should be aware of in case uh, you are uh, handling actual fonts. And then the last thing of exercise from what you're doing is, again, you use this account, account one, and again, I'm not referring to the MetaMask account one we set up last time, account one from Ganache to uh, make a transaction to account two. And that's it. That's really it. That allows you to set up your own blockchain. Um, that allows you to play around with it and uh, um, issue some first transactions against your personal blockchain. And it's super important that you actually do that because that's something we will heavily rely on or you should heavily rely on when you're developing later on uh, and you don't want to go with every single transaction to a public testnet. Now, how do you get your accounts created and funded? And uh, let's start with Ethereum mainnet. And uh, let me start by telling you, by, by giving you a quick disclaimer. Um, of course, none of this None of what I'm saying is investment advice and you should always be extremely careful. And in fact, you do not require any mainnet ether for this class. Anything I tell you, uh, you can, and I think personally you should do on test nets and on your private chains. Um, and then you don't have to go to any exchange and buy anything. You can just play around with something that has no value. And if you make a mistake, you're not gonna lose anything. Now, if you wanna try it out on mainnet, Everything we do in this class can also be done on mainnet, but you have to be extremely careful. You have to be aware that you can lose everything and you should not see it as an investment uh, when, you, when you're playing around uh, with, with these uh, with your own smart contracts, at least not as a financial investment. Uh, it, it can be an investment, of course, in your knowledge, in your education, but then again, you don't need EM mainnet ether for that, as I said. I mean, you can just do that in the public chain. So please be super careful. Uh, I just wanted to mention that you can do that. It's an option. Uh, also, just to tell you that we're not doing something theoretical. Um, everything we're showing you, everything we do in this class can be done on mainnet, but I think you should not do that because you put essentially essentially real value at risk. And that's something that should be avoided at this stage. Now, when you go when you talk about public test nets, you already know how that works with public test nets. You just go to a faucet as we have done with Robston and you get your free public test net ether and that's it. Then you can play around with it. You cannot really lose anything. Uh, I think that's just uh, great for gaining some experience. And with private chains, uh, when you're setting up your own local development uh, blockchain on your own computer uh, it's even easier as I as I said with Ganache you get some pre-funded accounts with your local test test Eve uh, for your Ganache chain and that's it and then you can play around with it so really for for this class for the entire process uh, of learning how to develop smart contracts of gaining some experience um, with decentralized finance there is absolutely no reason uh, to buy Ether um, and and play around with that and risk risk something with the real value. You are much better off when you're just using your own testnet chains. If you want some additional tips uh, and tutorials around these topics and uh, especially around uh, private chains, there is this tutorial by Hudson that we have referenced. That might be a, an interesting uh, link and the reference uh, for you if you want to learn some more about that topic. Now with the IDEs and the tool setup, um, the, in this class we will mostly use Remix. And it's just because Remix is extremely convenient. Uh, it's a browser-based IDE, so you just go to a website essentially and you can start developing your own smart contracts. It's, it's, it's great in terms of its features. It's not complete if you, if you have a really large project and of course you're not just relying on Remix, but we start out, it's super convenient. I think it's, it's a great tool for beginners when you're developing your own smart contracts. And you have the link right here. We will use that when we start uh, coding. And as I said, it's browser-based. 
Atom uh, is just a general purpose IDE that can be used pretty much for anything. And it also has a package so uh, um, with uh, Solidity highlighting. So it allows you to uh, develop your own smart contracts in Solidity and it's actually some great syntax highlighting in there. And this is something if you prefer to work in, a, uh, in an environment that is not part of your browser and something that um, is more common when you, also when you're developing something uh, for, for a larger project, then Atom might be the IDE of your choice. Again, for the examples, we will mainly use uh, Remix right here. And then, of course, something you should always use, no matter what you're doing, even if you just uh, uh, write a thesis when you have a, a larger document, uh, anything that is text-based, so either uh, an article, a paper, uh, but also, of course, in this case, code uh, development, you should use Git. Um, Git is just this versioning protocol, and uh, you're probably also familiar with GitHub, which is just a plot platform for uh, Git repositories. And what's great about that is that First of all, open source projects are free. So when you make it open to the public, the code, you don't have to pay anything uh, to GitHub. But what's even better is if you're a student, um, if you have a student ID, and I think they check it by looking at your email, um, then you get a pro account for free. Uh, so then you can even have some private repositories and some additional benefits uh, without having to pay anything. So you should check that out. Uh, it will help you a lot in the development process, especially if you're doing the group projects uh, for the University of Basel students, because it, it's, it's not just used for versioning, it's also great in collaboration um, where you, when you work together and you want to keep things uh, neat and under control, then Git is a really great choice for that. Now, how do you develop your small contract? I mean, as always, it's a good idea to, to think about what you want to do first, right? Uh, just, uh, I mean, we will look at, uh, when we look at the code, then you might want to rush into it and just start coding and trying out things. It's perfectly fine. But when you have a, something, an idea in mind, then it's usually a good idea to take a step back and, and think of the structure and what you want to do. And the first thing you should do is, of course, think about your, your goals. So what do you want to achieve with your smart contract? What do you want your smart contract to do? What's the goal? What do you want to create essentially? Then of course you need some variables. Um, you should also define them. So think of what do you want to store? What, what, what exactly uh, do you need? Uh, you, you have to think of the various variable types. And again, we will obviously look into them. They will all be used throughout our example. Um, and uh, of course also the size that is needed, so type and size. And then you have to define your functions. Remember functions, that's essentially what you call uh, with, a, with a transaction. So that's, that's the um, gateway for interaction. Somebody can send a transaction to the smart contract with a specific function. And then uh, the, the action in that function starts and will be executed. That's the basic idea. And then, of course, you have to ask, what functions do I need? What are they supposed to do? What's the idea? What's the structure? Uh, what input parameters, arguments do I need? And are there any access restrictions? Because in many cases, functions should not be executable just by anyone. There are also permissions involved. So these are the things you should, you should think of before you start coding. And then once you are developing a smart contract, you write it, you test it, obviously. Um, but then there is a process called compilation. And to understand compilation, you have to understand that what we're doing here, writing the smart contract using Solidity is in fact a relatively high level language. So it's something that is optimized for human readability and structured with humans in mind. But before you can deploy that, before you actually send it to the blockchain, what happens is the compilation, the compilation into uh, bytecode and the bytecode, that's the, the machine readable code, so the, the really low level instructions, that is what is actually deployed on the blockchain. That is the code that gets actually executed. And Solidity is just some abstraction, something you write, something that gets compiled later on into bytecode. There are some options to Solidity, for example, Viper is one other programming language. It's the exact same principle, it's just a different language, but then it gets compiled into bytecode. LLL is another uh, option. 
And um, in addition to the bytecode, one more thing you get when you compile it is the so-called ABI, the uh, application binary interface. And that's just uh, essentially a list uh, of contract functions and their arguments, a JSON-based list, and uh, some encoding and decoding uh, of the data, uh, some instructions how to do that. So you can think of it a little bit like a, a translation. Um, like an instruction of how you can interact with that specific smart contract, for example, for front ends and so on. And what's important to understand is that you have to keep on to that ABI, have to uh, hold on to that ABI. The bytecode is deployed on the blockchain. The I ABI is not deployed on the blockchain. That's something that's stored separately, for example, in the front end. And without the ABI, applications would not know the available functions uh, and function arguments. And as I said, the API can essentially be thought of as a, as a translation. Uh, so as your way of interacting with a specific smart contract of understanding what the smart contract expects from you. And that's what the API is for. Contact deployment is the next step. That's when you're actually writing your smart contract to the blockchain. Again, and I think you know that by now, contract deployment refers to creating your contract on the blockchain and recall that you do that by sending the bytecode via a transaction to the zero address. So that's how your smart contract is created. Then your smart contract, your contract account gets its own address, as we have seen in the account-based model video. You can either compile and deploy a contract directly from most uh, development framework. So for example, Remix also allows you to do that. There you have some buttons where you can compile it. There you have a, also buttons where you can deploy it directly, uh, depending on how you have things set up. And we will look into that. Of course, you need to confirm that with MetaMask. If you're doing it locally, for example, with the JavaScript uh, virtual machine in Remix directly, then you don't need to do that because in that case, you're not connecting to your blockchain. Or what you could also do is you could use any wallet manually create your uh, transaction and just deploy the bytecode. And that's essentially the same thing. I mean, when you're using something like Remix, that's exactly what Remix does. It proposes a transaction with the bytecode that gets deployed um, to the blockchain, essentially. Now, last but not least, testing. And testing is super important, not just in the smart contract and blockchain context, but here, of course, it's of particular importance uh, because when you're developing, for example, a static smart contract, something that just um, is created once, it's on the blockchain, it cannot be changed, it's immutable, uh, then of course you, you better make sure before deployment that it actually runs as it was intended. So you have to be extremely certain before you put it into production, before you put it on the blockchain, that there aren't any mistakes on there. In contrast to more centralized software that um, runs under the uh, centralized control, for example, of an entity, in many cases, you cannot roll back things and mistakes, uh, box can have severe uh, consequences for all parties that are involved. So. It's super important that you test your smart contracts. Um, also, I mean, when we talk about DeFi, for example, when we talk about actual contracts in production, in many cases, uh, they go through audits. Uh, we have some specialized firms that actively look for mistakes, actively look for bugs in there, uh, and then uh, they write reports. Um, they run some various tests against it, but that's something that should not be neglected and something uh, I mean, you cannot test enough. Just make sure that your contracts actually run uh, the way they're supposed to run. You can, of course, do that manually, um, but this will only get you uh, so far uh, with Remix and MetaMask. Try different arguments, try unusual uh, ways of interacting with your smart contract, uh, see if everything happens as it is supposed to. But manual tests, I mean, they are great and it's the first step, but it's not sufficient in most cases. It, it is, to be clear, sufficient for this class, so don't worry about it too much. But if you want to do something in production, then you need some automated testing. And automated testing, there are things like hard hat, like brownie, like truffle. These really are some uh, ways of creating some automated test cases, uh, namely here in JavaScript and in Python. And then you run these tests, uh, they get evaluated, uh, and uh, this just allows you to 
uh, run massive amounts of tests and, and code them in a flexible way, things you could never do when you're just manually testing. And that's what these frameworks are for. All right, so the first thing we have to do is download Ganache. You simply go to trufflesuite.com slash Ganache. You also have that link on your slides. Then uh, you click on that button right here, which uh, depending on your OS may look a little different. And uh, I have already installed Ganache, so let me switch. That's what you're seeing when you have installed it. Uh, you simply click on Quick Start Ethereum. It sets up everything behind the scenes. Here you have your pre-founded accounts. And then you go to settings right here. And the first thing you have to do is click on server, host name. You change this to all interfaces right here. Looks like the uh, port number is already set correctly right here. So you don't have to change anything. Uh, what you do have to change is network ID. You basically uh, use the chain ID on the, on the slides put in uh, 1337 and then uh, you click on uh, save and restart right here. It gets restarted, creates new accounts and then you're all set to go. Then you quickly switch to uh, your browser. Here you change the network. So you go from Robston to localhost 8545, click on that right here. Obviously your account one doesn't have any funding. So you have to import a new account and you do that by clicking on here, import account, uh, select type private key. You quickly go back to your ganache and here on the right side, you have the show keys option where you can show the private key. Obviously that's something you shouldn't do when we talk about actual funds. Um, showing that on screen, but here it doesn't really matter. And as you can see, we have 100 ETH on that account. So you're connected to localhost. Uh, in this case, it's called account five because it's the fifth one I've created, but it's the account one from Ganache. When we go to account one on this chain, that's the one you set up for Robston, we have nothing, but when you go to Robston, so when you change the network to Robston test network, then you can see your previous amount and uh, when you go back to localhost and you're connected to your private chain again, and then you have zero ETH. Now, here we have the account five. So that's the first Ganache account once again. Let us actually add another one. So we do that again for the second Ganache account. We again take the private key, go back. Uh, we again add another um, account to the MetaMask extension by import account. We do that through private key. And you can see also 100 ETH. Now let me switch to account five or account one in Ganache. Uh, and then we say transfer between accounts, choose account six, that's account two in Ganache. And we're gonna transfer 10 ETH. As you can see that right here, we confirm. And then when we go back to Ganache and remember that this is a, a blockchain private one where you instead of an instantaneous transfer, you can see it reflected with 110 ETH and 90 ETH for these two accounts. Congratulations on setting up your private test blockchain for the development of smart contracts. And with that, you are also at the end of the introductory workflow Ethereum basic parts. And in the next video, we can finally get to coding our own smart contracts. With that, stay curious. See you soon.